Hi, this is Dr. Graves back with part five of the economic geography lecture. Uh, we were talking about the manufacturing of automobiles in the United States and one of the things that I think probably everybody ought to take a look at is something called just-in-time production. Just-in-time production was introduced to the United States uh, automobile manufacturing business by the Japanese in the 70s or maybe the 80s and um, it required some things that weren't really available in the United States or elsewhere for that matter until maybe the 1970s and those two things were high-speed communication um, meaning the, the sort of thing that we have today is uh, texting and the internet um, at least fax machines and also high-speed transportation and so what what happens in just-in-time production is that rather than automobile factories, the main assembly plants in particular, having multiple warehouses full of the parts that they need to assemble an automobile, instead what they have are a series of small um, parts suppliers that only make enough of the parts for the car for essentially one day's production. Um, and so um, what a rather than having say you know 5,000 uh, car bumpers in the bumper warehouse up in Detroit at the assembly factory you would uh, eliminate that so it eliminates warehouse jobs uh, so those are those are gone um, and instead, what you would have is just uh, you would make a phone call to the parts supplier essentially the day before and say, okay, we're going to build um, 50 cars tomorrow. I want you to show up, you know, at the door tomorrow morning with 50 bumpers. And you would do the same thing with the, the tire guys and uh, the people who make the windshields and the gear shift knobs and every single thing. They only supply what is necessary to build the car in short numbers just before. So it eliminates um, a warehousing jobs, it eliminates um, the warehouses themselves and the costs associated with that uh, if something goes wrong with the automobile the manufacturing process that um, you don't have say 5,000 bumpers that don't fit in a, in a warehouse uh, so it makes um, it eliminates inflexibility uh, say nobody wants that car you don't have a whole bunch of parts laying around that will never get used and will have to um, be essentially thrown away or melted down or whatever um, it also eliminates um, some of the flexibility that the factories have in terms of, of uh, leverage over employees. So uh, two things have happened re regarding um, labor. One is that a lot of these small factories, which I show up in uh, purple here, these are the parts suppliers, and they're, they're making things like the seat covers and the I don't know, the carburetors and the mirrors or whatnot for, and that they will all deliver those to a single factory, uh, you know, virtually every day. Um, but most of these little purple factories are non-union. So uh, there's competition between them, oftentimes, to supply the parts as cheaply as possible. And so that's not good for um, people who would like to have high-wage um, union jobs uh, secured by the UAW, which is the United Auto Workers. And so that's a problem because a lot of uh, the jobs at these uh, part suppliers, uh, lower wage, lower benefits, uh, poor working conditions than the same, the, the people working to assemble the cars on the black, um, uh, in the main factories that might be um, either the black dots, but I guess I don't really see the, the we should have big black dots on here. On the other hand, there is a benefit to labor in the just-in-time system. 
So uh, there's a good example of a, a part supplier over here near uh, Dayton, um, Ohio, at the Moraine plant. And Moraine is a small town in Ohio near Dayton. And they had a factory there that supplied, uh, I don't know what it was, say, um, starter motors to the cars. And they went on strike. Um, but because of the factory that they were delivering to, um, didn't have a large supply of this part that they were delivering, that factory had to shut down. And when they shut down the main factory, all the other part suppliers also shut down as well. And so it, it created this chain of um, cl plant closures all over the United States because one factory that built something that was critical to the automobile um, suddenly shut down and therefore the main assembly factory didn't need any other parts because they couldn't uh, manufacture the car without say a starter motor or steering wheels or whatever um, and so that puts uh, labor at an advantage because they can shut down multiple plants um, by going on strike. So it's been both good and bad for um, workers. The last sector we're going to talk about is tertiary, which is another word for the service sector, and tertiary means the third sector. There are also sometimes a fourth and a fifth sector and uh, called the quaternary and the quinary sectors, and we'll uh, talk to, about those momentarily, um, but not all um, scholars recognize these four and five, the fourth and fifth sectors. Um, so the tertiary sector is basically the third one. Yeah, the first one is sort of, if you think about uh, oil, pulling the, the oil out of the ground, that's the primary sector. Changing the oil then to uh, gasoline is the secondary sector, or manufacturing. And the tertiary sector is what people do with it after that. They have to transport it, they have to sell it, they have to market it, and all of that sort of thing is the service sector. Uh, the service sector is huge today compared to what it was in 1970. Uh, the manufacturing sector has shrunk uh, dramatically and the service sector has boomed. Uh, this includes retail, research, transportation, communications, utilities, tourism, everything that is not in either taking stuff out of the ground or manufacturing. Um, the service sector, this tertiary sector, is both good and bad. Um, one of the big problems with um, towns nowadays is this thing called the multiplier leakage. Now we saw that with the primary sector, uh, say where a coal town mines all the coal uh, the people, the coal miners make some money, but all the profits really leave and go to Wall Street or something. Well, that is a real huge problem with um, the service sector in recent years, especially because Walmart is the, the largest employer in many states and in many economies. Walmart is not headquartered locally. It's headquartered somewhere in in Arkansas and has uh, shareholders on Wall Street and so when Walmart comes in and wipes out all the mom and pop stores the profitability of the um, the local uh, retail economy all escapes and that leaks out and when that happens it doesn't create new jobs within the economy one of the things that's interesting about when Walmart shows up, not only do all the local mom and pop stores, the locally owned one goes out of business, but other things like the local newspaper and the local radio station often go out of business because it was the mom and pop stores that advertised locally, that advertised on the radio station. So that's um, a faltering of the multiplier effect and an increase in the multiplier leakage. The other thing, the increasing concentration of power and wealth, I'll talk about that in the next slide. Um, what we've seen is something called a bifurcation of the economy because service sector jobs sometimes are high tech, high wage, and sometimes are low tech, low wage. And you really want to be in the high tech, high wage um, 
And so that great leveling factor, the manufacturing jobs, the kind that my dad had with uh, uh, an eighth grade education, those have shrunk. And with it, the working class, the middle class, and what you've got is a great expansion of the working poor, people that have a job but live paycheck to paycheck, may not be able to pay the rent if they got sick or something, and then a smaller group of people on the high end that are making an enormous amount of money, but there are just too few of them. Here's uh, the example of that. The people who work at Walmart working for minimum wage without uh, benefits, without um, proper vacation, without health insurance, and um, there's a lot of jobs there. There have also been a number of jobs produced at places that are high tech, high wage, good benefits and everything, but they're too few and they're too concentrated in too few places in the country. And so some people are making a lot of money, some people are making just enough to survive, but so many of the old jobs that were somewhere in between, those are gone. This is a graphic that just shows how the um, since particularly the 1980s, the, the upper class, the uh, wealthier people, have really improved their lot, where the um, lowest 20th percentile of the economy down here, the people who are working at places like Mc, McDonald's and Walmart, haven't improved themselves at all, and in many ways have gotten poor since the 1980s. Uh, they weren't doing great to begin with, but there was sort of an upper trend uh, through the 1970s. But what's more concerning is that there was a pretty good upward trend for the people sort of in the middle up until about 1980, and then it's sort of leveled off for these people in the blue and the green line. And so people are not doing better than um, they were uh, their grandparents and their their parents were, and if they are, there's uh, some of the lucky few up here, which is why getting a good education is so important. The wealth gap between um, the the poorest and the richest have grown quite a bit since uh, Ronald Reagan came in. He changed fundamentally the nature of the American economy. Well, it wasn't just him, but um, him and Congress and this sort of thing. The, um, the measure of uh, in a, uh, inequality called the Gini coefficient has gone up in the United States, and you see it is worse in California, partly because the rich people have gotten so much richer. It doesn't mean the poor have gotten poor. That's actually happened in places like this and Texas, where the rich have gotten richer, but the poor have actually gotten poor. Um, so California and New York are two places where the rich really have gotten rich, and that's uh, the high-tech sector and Wall Street. Some of the places out here really have a, um, a low Gini coefficient, which is nice because uh, they've got a sizable middle class, and these are often farm economies where uh, people of equal uh, farm sizes, etc., are nearly all equal. Um, our Gini coefficient in the United States is far greater than what you see in Europe or Japan. Ours is actually closer to what you see in much of Latin America. This has lots of implications, even for people's health. Uh, people aren't as healthy in neighborhoods where they're the, they, uh, their neighbors are much richer than them, and so it's an interesting thing. So here's the U.S., uh, the Gini coefficient, in comparison to uh, sort of Latin America. We, we would like to be in the green, where you have lots of uh, middle class people. These are the dreaded socialist economies up here that um, so many people don't like in the United States. And uh, some of that is nothing, um, it has a lot to do with sort of health care. Look at Japan's uh, equal distribution. And we are not quite as bad as Latin America or Africa, but um, we're not really um, as well off as we should be in terms of the wealth gap. Um, and we're moving more towards the Latin American model. The rich get richer and the poor get poorer.
And that ends this uh, segment, 1.1.